we will now proceed to our second knowledge session and this session is called breakthroughs for health with nutritious food i would first like to invite the moderator of this session dr bobby john to please come up on the stage while i introduce and call upon our other panelists first panelist for this uh, the nutritious food session is sucharita datta country director nutrition international india our next panelist is mr parth patel business director south asia dupont nutrition and health i now invite dr gayatri swahar ceo of ycook india dr gayatri swahar is also the co-founder and brand custodian of ycook thank you so much i now hand over the session to dr john because when we talk about food um it gets dominated at home by the person serving it we always talk about ghar ka khana and maa ka khana while on the field though the picture might be of the male farmer toiling away the reality is much of our agriculture is on the back of frail women the other reality is that the most undernourished in our country are perhaps those that belong into farming families and communities in our rural areas the situation doesn't get dramatically different when we come into a urban hinterland where our slums where our low income communities live it's only as we tend towards the centers of cities that we see body mass indexes change but that's an old picture too over the last 30 years we also see that the body mass indices in this country have also begun changing with people bloating up not because they're eating too much but because they're eating wrong and so therefore we are in a curious situation where one sixth of humanity has got both a large burden of undernourished people especially among women and children and we also have an increasing number of people who are badly nourished and obese that seems to be a twin peak epidemic as far as malnutrition is concerned in india thank you all for being with us and i want to kind of take this conversation through each of your lenses somebody who's worked with communities looking at a public health perspective somebody who's working in the space where we are now talking about commercially determined health and to somebody who's saying can behavior be changed by cooking practices whether it's in the workplace or homes or in the communities so jayanta nutrition initiative you're saying that little bits of micronutrients can actually make big differences at a time when people's calorie intakes are not that much more dramatically improved where does micronutrients and their addition actually make a big difference okay so pm definitely was an issue protein energy malnutrition protein energy malnutrition was an issue few years back few decades back which means that people were taking lesser amounts of protein, protein in comparison to the amount of carbohydrates they were getting correct yes correct. however with a lot of uh, uh, focus of the government also i would say and a lot of uh, discussion around this there has been some improvement on it it is not nutrition international which says that mns are important micronutrients are important it is also the copenhagen consensus which says that just adding micronutrient could actually that that is the cheapest and the most cost effective give me an way. example uh, for example if you have iron if you have iodine it all impacts your overall health it impacts your cognitive ability it and if you don't have your health if you are suffering from anemia if you are not mentally in a level wherein you can take in the education that you are going for if you cannot attend school then obviously all this are going to impact just not the health of the individual and the family but also the nation overall so yes mns do make a huge difference 
and I think this is being recognized over the years. This was not discussed few years back, but uh, we do see the government also now taking, talking proactively. We were only talking of supplementation in past, but I think fortification is also becoming an important aspect of overall food basket when we talk of nutrition. So let me pick up a couple of things that you have said and unpack them up for our audience too. You said that we've had a transition from a time when protein energy malnutrition was a, a big uh, face of malnutrition for our country. We've seen that with uh, time, there's been a easing out of that situation. So the number of children that are severely acutely malnourished or in protein energy malnutrition or the kosher core uh, faces, those have reduced. So we don't have as many lemon on matchstick kind of children out there. So that's changed. That's good. That's thanks to both our Green Revolution historically. That's thanks to better amounts of proteins now being available on the table, including better av availabilities of lentils, pulses, and also eggs and other non-vegetarian items. Sorry? Milk. And, and milk. Flood. Sorry. Yes. And completely uh, not to miss milk and operation flood. So that's just kind of changed dramatically. Yeah. Let me ask the audience a question. How many of you have in, recent, in the recent past seen men or women or children with a big swelling under their neck. What we call goiter. Goiter. Yeah. Anybody? No. Chances are you haven't. And the reason being that nearly 25, is it 25 years now that we legislated, two, two, yeah. two and a half decades, that we legislated that all salt in this country would be iodized. A little bit of iodine in salt transform the face of iodine deficiency goiters right. in this country to a point of non-existence. Today you do not see it. More seriously, you do not see children being born to iodine deficient women and so therefore the notion of cretinism today does not even um, arise all that much. And so therefore we have had a big change in the way um, things are looking in the tr nutrition space. Yes. So those are the good news. What's the bad news? The bad news is that uh, we have been, uh, we have moved into a phase when government is pushing PDS, ICDS, PDS, which is Public, public Distribution, distribution system. of System, okay. ICDS, ICDS, which is the Anganwadi is distributing Integrated food, Child Integrated Development, Child Development, Development Services, and of course your MDM, which is midday the Midday means. means. So all these programs that the government have is actually promoting rice and wheat and therefore a lot of other the millets, pulses which were so very ingrained in our regular routine food is gradually moving out of our plates. So and therefore I will give you an example. Way back pellagra was quite an epidemic. Pellagra, vitamin DB6 deficiency? It is nicotinamide. Nic nicotinamide, sorry. Yeah. My, my deficiency. Yeah. Very, 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 very was also there. So all that we did was not supplement the community or the population for that. All that was done was a policy level decision, wherein the decision was that if beriberi -beri is the cause of much consumption of uh, rice which is highly polished, why can't we have rice which is not polished? So it was a very simple thing. It was not something uh, rocket science that was done, but it did make a difference to beriberi. -beri. Similarly, Pellegra. It was not again an introduction of some supplementation. It was basically telling that if pellegra is because there is too much of eating of jawar, can you mix it? Can you have other staples also along with jawar, other millets also added to it? And we saw that there is a difference. So I think it is important that uh, we do look into these kind of things which currently we are not. And we are into a lot of processed food. We'll, 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 we'll come there. We'll come there in a second. But, but thanks. I mean, when you're saying that we have increased availability of food, we also have, with very little tweaks, but very strategic ones, we've been able to eliminate certain uh, health situations or deficiencies simply because we said we should not polish rice too much, therefore robbing it of its nutrient cap capacities. We should not have, we should have a better mix of the kind of cereals that we eat so that we avoid certain kind of deficiencies. We add or supplement, say, salt with iodine. 
and today we are also adding iron to some of our salt. Uh, salt so that we are attempting not only to correct at an individual level certain deficiencies but at a population okay. level we are able to sort out things at scales which were unimaginable before imagine the numbers of people who would turn up into hospitals with very low any very low hemoglobin levels today over a sustained um, nutritional intervention you are able to raise that albeit by not by dramatically at individual levels but it's it's it, the trajectory is generally on the upward trend anemia has not been impacted to that extent as much yes. it still remains yeah. a problem and a that problem. we need to kind of also address in the context of women the gender relationships and the food distribution at the home levels and we will come to that shortly that's a broad brush picture where we've kind of come to over the last 50 years 30 years 20 years in this time we've also seen that food has become highly processed industry has moved in in a way that has transformed our basket or our plate that we have in front of us where it would be a long set of processes at home now it's all done you open the package and then with a little bit more of effort you've got tada a good meal how is commerce how is the market shaping the nutrition story in india so i'll take a step back uh, and and try and explain uh, answer that question so if you look at the numbers right india is urbanizing like india is urbanizing 30% today 50% in the next 20 years right uh, double income couples are increasing by a massive rate right so you have in a family husband and wife working and you have one or two kids and these are usually nuclear families so as you urbanize you have more double income income or uh, double income families with 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 kids and the gdp is growing we are getting a richer country right every year 6 7% growth of gdp the next 10 15 years has been projected so if you look at these three big macro trends right urbanization is happening you have double income kids as as more and more women participate in the workforce you have uh, families that are getting richer what is happening is people are moving more and more towards convenience due to a lack of time right like you just pointed out right now my mother would always cook at home right but me and my wife both of us are working we don't have that time so what do we do we go for convenience right so those are the trends that are actually driving the indian consumer to move more and more towards packaged food and this is this is a phenomenon we've seen not only in the cities but also in tier 2 and tier 3 markets where we are seeing a lot of indian consumers are now uh, looking at at convenience at a little added value right as an example uh, you know i have a 5 year old son at home uh, those of you have uh, young kids will sympathize with me that it's very difficult and a behavior starts shaping up at the age of 3 right 3 4 and 5 and it's very difficult to to actually uh, rationalize with with kids so what do you do with them right how do you how do you make sure they eat healthy because the, these are the habits you drill now will define their future so uh, things we do at home little things right the way we manage things at home uh, you know you we, the way we eat at home makes a big difference in the way the future generation of this country uh, will eat and that's not only packaged food but also the the food that most of us used to eat when we were younger so a couple of things there i mean i just want to pull back for for us to think about you you mentioned about this increasing trend of urbanization of double income families perhaps with lesser number of children that is true in 1950 we had an average for a total fertility rate of closer to 6.7 today it is closer to 2.3 2.2 and and so therefore that's coming down but there's one place where i will take issue with you on that there's double work always in every family rural and urban it just so happens that one part of it doesn't get compensated for at any point in time so when i started off and i said that there's a large number of uh, the uh, preponderance of our agricultural labor is women it happens to be from the household they do work so it's double work it just may not be double income so just want to kind of leave that as a backdrop to then the later question because those families 
like the double income families in urban settings, both are looking for conveniences. So we have seen consumption pattern shifts where mothers used to pack or make rotis and make long lasting ones at that in rural and urban areas. Today, the convenience of opening up a packet of biscuits with doubtful nutritious value, nutrition value is, is this convenience. The act of feeding is done. There is the, how should I say this, uh, assurance that it comes from a packet so therefore there's some quality attached to it. But in reality, it's money out of their pocket and very little nutrition that's come back in. How do we go back or is there a way that the packages can be better nutritionally? Gotcha. Yeah, I think I want to just uh, step back uh, one, one, uh, one notch and just look at this whole issue if you were to think about it. If Karela was the most nutritious, why don't we all love to eat Karelas? So if you actually go to how man evolved just by the encephalization, the bipedalism, we started walking on two legs, this huge hungry brain that we had to marry, there was an evolutionary inclination towards high calorie and high sugary food because at that point of time, calories meant hard work and calories came with nourishment. But in today's world, we have created an ecosystem where calories are becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and nutrition is getting expensive. And we've also calories are getting cheaper, cheaper and nutrition, nutrition is, is getting being expensive. expensive. Okay. And what is also happening in this ecosystem, given our food technology expertise, is that we have uh, we have mastered the art of creating empty calorie food. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, so I'm just taking a name for the want of a name. The most uh, loved food in the world is Cheetos. You take it, the brain is thinking, oh my God, orange color is going to be nutritious. Put it inside. Wow, there's an innovation factor in the you don't even realize that you're eating it. And just, just think about the India Health and Wellness Summit. We are so here thinking about health, but just because we are in Eros in a five-star hotel, imagine the food that was served to us during tea. Was there one amount of, a youth of nutrition? What is there on your desk? It is empty calories. Because we have started associating these calories to celebrations. And with all of this comes this whole marketing where it is entirely uh, starting to appeal to our hedonistic self. Okay? So think of the health food. This is very healthy. It doesn't have the yo factor, what the child wants. Be it in an urban uh, India, I mean, I think communication spreads so much. We have to have the zing, it has to have the yo, it has to have this wow factor, nothing we are able to do. So what is actually creating this entire ecosystem is putting the owners back on maybe processing industries, maybe, uh, yes, convenience is a need for the R. And I do agree that it's not about dual career families. My mother now is time pressed because she's a member of some 10 family groups, families of friends and friends of families. And she just has to, she takes an R to forward one to here, one to here. I mean, I mean, it is a need of the R. So everybody is seeking that. So where is it the ownership starting to come? So ownership has to start across from house, uh, to food processing industries too because we are we are going against evolution. If you want to make your child to eat greens, why don't they wantedly, why do you have to have a Maggie? Because it has some neuro exciters. Why is your greens not having? Because it had a satiating power. So we are fighting an evolutionary component and uh, the food technologists and uh, junk food companies have already leveraged it. We are slightly far behind. So, so let me pull, pull a couple of things here. One of the things that you said was calories are getting cheaper, nutrition is getting expensive. Um, just to kind of illustrate that, I mean, roughly about 200 years ago, it was, it was one person's labor for a week for a lump of sugar. Imagine this, okay? Refined sugar, a lump of refined sugar was one week's labor. Today, a kilogram of sugar is dirt cheap. That's how far we are now in terms of the availability of cheap calories. Yes. And I use sugar as elemental because it forms part of everything else. We went into large scale farming in a way that mass produced corn or cereals and processed in such a way that it would stretch far. And today, we, this country, sits on give or take. I mean, my numbers may be slightly off. We may be sitting on close to a fourth of global rice stocks and a third of, uh, and, and a fifth of global wheat stocks. 
That's unimaginable, say, 50 years ago, when we were in the throes of a famine and we needed a green revolution to come through. So Charita mentioned that we have a public distribution system now that has pushed all the output, brilliant as it was, into the community where we are getting an oversupply of wheat and of rice and very little else. And so what we have today is then the push towards what's basic carbohydrates, then processed and empty um, calories and wrapped up into the zing and the um, convenience factors to say to people, hey, look, you're doing a good thing. How sustainable is this, Sujaita? Uh, From a human health perspective. How sustain? I think we are already seeing the effect of what we are doing. Which no? is? Which is obesity. Which obesity? Is, uh, it is all to do with the wrong, uh, unhealthy, non-nutritious food that we as a community, and it is not just affordability. The, the most important part is that even in a rural setup, these have percolated. So what she's talking about, the uh, low uh, nutritious, uh, nutrition food, it is not restricted to only the urban setting. A, a child in the rural setup also will be getting a maggi and a biscuit and parents will be happy to buy them that because it has been packaged and marketed in such a way that even the parents have that impression that it is good for the health of a child. If not good, it will not do any damage. And we are seeing like the southern states, there are districts wherein we have 48% obesity. So it's huge. So we are seeing this transformation of health status among children, among adults, because the consumption patterns have changed. So for solutions then, so Jaita states the problems. For solutions then, so, so Parth. Uh, I, I kind of uh, disagree a little bit there. I think it would be very simplistic to assume that uh, the cause of obesity in this country is only food. Right? Correct. It's not only it's food. It's multifactorial. It's a lot of factors. Okay. It's our lifestyle. It's what we do, our genetics, a lot of things, right? Sure. So, so, uh, so uh, hold so, on a second. Yeah. So when we say lifestyle, lifestyle includes your mobility, like, your consumption. Like the question that was asked, how many of us exercise every day? Sure. And four hands went up in the room. Fair enough. How many of us eat every day? Fair enough. Okay. But how many of us eat what kind of food also would be the question. It does that same thing. Okay. Please go on. Carry so, it does matter what we eat, absolutely. Sure. And I completely agree with ma'am here when she said at the start that there's been a lot of focus on micronutrients, right? It's very important from a, from a nourishment point of view. But what about the macronutrients? That's equally important. You talk about uh, proteins, you talk about fiber. There's a research that says 75% of Indians lack uh, fiber, good quality fiber. 75% That's, that's because we remember. end up processing our cereals so badly that there's no fiber left in them. That could be one reason, right. but, but there are multiple reasons. The food we eat, again, sure. right? 90% yep. of Indians are protein deficient, right? Still. That's because of our uh, inherent... Uh, um, the food we eat. The food we eat is, is this kind of push towards a vegetarianism kind of a uh, thing. And we haven't invested in our lentil and uh, pulses yeah. production. Right. So, so we, do have a, we do have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So we do have a problem. How do you solve that problem? Right? Yes. So the food that we eat has to be nutritious at a micronutrient level and at a macronutrient level. Right? And today what we are consuming is not there. So somebody has to come in and fill, it, fill that gap. And I completely agree, uh, some of the food that is out there is marketed as healthy is probably not. But there's a lot of options out there which are packaged and which are actually healthy. But it's just the, the question of awareness which is I think not there. Yeah. And also the fact that sometimes uh, food that is healthy is perceived as expensive. So consumers typically don't tend to go for it. Right. So could I kind of um, put a reality check from a personal viewpoint here? I consume bread very regularly. Bread is supposed to be bad because that is refined flour, a lot of fat, a lot of sugar that's going into you. Except that at home we don't buy bread. That bread is baked at home. Now I have the luxury of it because we have Space. the abilities to do it, <laughs> right? When I compare what is bad with what I'm consuming, I realize that 
bread, what is sold as bread, is not bread. It could be marginally better than cardboard. With all due respect for all the producers and consumers of bread, healthy or non-healthy, it isn't. My question is, when will we up our standards when we mass produce and commercially produce food to be of nutritional quality that's adequate for human consumption? Because we know comparatively, that's why we say ghar ka khana versus what is produced out of a packet. When will we get our game up in the commercially produced side? Because we need it. If the convenience factor is absolutely undeniable, when will we get the industry side to up the nutrition game? So I, I think um, I, I think the industry, if you were to see, quite a lot of startups, including ourselves, we uh, entirely play in the space of healthy, affordable, uh, nutritious, wholesome food. We, uh, so, so basically, we do boiled food, which is you can just open, and your garka kana is also happening, and your convenience is also happening. You can just open and toss out a tadka. The whole um, gamut, yes. What happens in uh, for any of the startups? They're not only us. There are quite a lot of startups, quite a lot of innovation that has happened in the space that can actually bring in your garka kana without touching your taste, without touching your convenience, quick uh, toss out stuff. Uh, in fact, uh, we've gone back to even c produce zero pesticide residue food. The two challenges, though, remain: uh, is one is retailing, and second is marketing. So we would need. And any, any of the innovations would need a lot more incentivizing. For example, if you have a priority sector lending in a bank, we don't have a priority sector retailing in, in any, of your, uh, uh, any of your retail outlets. So uh, I could never, ever, in spite of giving zero pesticide residue, fully nutritious food um, that can be eaten out and sweet corns, which the kids also love, I don't have a, uh, I mean, I don't have a favorable margin which a retailer can give me. I will have to pay for the margin. I have to pay for the space. Most of the times, it gets translated to the consumer and making it unaffordable. So if you don't want to do that, then you have to compete with them on marketing, So which becomes very, very difficult, unless incentivized from a retailer perspective and from a marketing perspective, because media is very expensive. So, uh, I mean, every second costs money. I'm definitely not going to be in a position to... See, sometimes it feels very bad that we have very good nutrition. We just can't take it because we can't afford to spend it. So, That's where we are. So here you are, um, one step above an ambitious household. You are a startup who's trying to put a good quality product out there with nearly all the constraints of a household. You don't have a marketing budget. You have a great idea and a great product. But it just doesn't go that far because you are trying to finance it. And you're saying, shouldn't this be a priority sector? And here's where I would kind of look at the larger industry. And this is not to kind of single out you and DuPont, but, but the many like you. At what point of time does this ambition and this product offering become something that's mainstream for the larger food processing and manufacturing industry? So I can give you a, a, a small example. So in the dairy industry, right, uh, typically uh, most of us, uh, we, we uh, make dahi at home. Yes. Right, most of us do that. But now you're seeing a strong growth in, uh, in, the, in the dahi industry. So you, now many of us go outside, we buy dahi and we come back, right? Simple dahi. But if you look at the innovations on the food technology side, right, probiotics. So every dahi has probiotics, right? But if you look at the, if you look at the, the quantum of probiotics, it's not enough. So what we do, you, you have probiotic dahis out there in the market, which give you that level of comfort. So for instance, one of the biggest issues most Indians face is trouble with the gut, right? You have good bacteria, you have bad bacteria, right? And probiotics are good bacteria. So how do you replenish good bacteria in, a, in an innovative way and in an affordable way, right? So that's one example that I can think of where the industry has taken a lot of steps to not only educate the customer, the consumers, but also make it a bit more uh, accessible. It's and also a product space where you can't do too much wrong either, yeah. right? But in the other spaces where there's the headroom for doing so much more right, why, what's, what's preventing us from doing the right things or from scaling up the kind of offerings that Gayatri is offering here? No, I think some of it, I think as consumers here, we also have to take the ownership. Okay, uh, like all of us, I mean, I do have a three-year-old, he has a five-year-old. We're just not able to stop. We're giving it to irrationality. It's like saying, if, if your child says, I mean, I, I'm as uh, guilty as you would. If, if my, my child comes and says, hey, I want to have a 
Coke, yeah. and I know it's very, 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 very bad, but somewhere you kind of give in assuming that it's okay, but am I going to be doing the same thing for, uh, say, if she says, I'm going to go and smoke, and I'm going to say no, right? So somewhere I think as consumers, we also give in to, uh, so we all, I mean, if you were to think offices, parties means cakes, why can't parties means fruits? Why can't uh, celebration mean something nutritious? Every time celebration means chocolates. And we have not asked a company, I mean, if it is good, say if it's a candy, has there been a label that says, okay, uh, people advertise eating a whole bar of chocolate, but has there been saying only this much is good for your child or this is the recommended quality and we've never asked for it. We've never fought for it. And most importantly, I think we have just given in to it. Because so, we are also going with our hedonistic self, we also want to just be nice, be this good, uh, happening uh, things. I think uh, consumers are also in a way not asking for it and hence giving in to this. So there's both a push and a pull. I mean, you've seen the ad, um, you can't stop at one. One, yeah. Right? And it kind of encourages you to take that second portion. What is portion control? Does it get determined by the advertising and the subtle messaging that's coming to and me, it also happens that, that's to one. And second is, how much of it is voluntary, volitional at our end, which says, I have had enough and we need not have the second bit. Is there a momentum of, and I'm going to use this very carefully, poverty-minded thinking in our head that if we don't have the second one, it's going to go to waste. Is that running at the back end that prompts a little bit more of that extra consumption, both celebratory and second, to avoid the guilt of wastage. And this is what I want to kind of test it out with the three of you. Yeah, I, th I think uh, women are the greatest victims to this because you just don't want to throw it. And yeah, we, we, we do land up consuming all the 45 rupees of chocolates that you kind of otherwise would have thrown. So, so, so there, is, there is this message then there that it doesn't matter that you've paid for it. Pay for what you want and consume what is necessary. Right now we are paying for what we don't want and we consume what is more Not than required. necessary, leaving us poorer in the pocket and perhaps more That's obese right. than we wanted to be. John, I would just want to add Loud, to what louder, please. I would want to add to what you are saying. You know, whatever we are talking over here is more to do with the urban Sure. Population. When you go to the rural population, number one, they don't even have the information. She, Gayatri is talking about, uh, uh, I as a consumer, I think I am quite empowered, I am quite informed, but I really, when I go to buy things, there are so many things out there, it is very difficult for me to decide and for everything I pick up from there, I, am, I have the suspicion whether what is written on this package is actually true. So what she is saying that we don't, it is not that we don't want to uh, uh, buy and it is a responsibility of the consumer, number of times the consumer is actually not aware of the nutrition value of the food that uh, he or she, and I am talking of the urban consumer, forget about the rural, they, neither do they have choice, nor do they have information, nor do they have the luxury or affordability to go and buy something that they wish they would have got for their kids. So I, I think in India it is quite a, uh, I mean, when we look into urban and the rural, there is a lot of things that needs to be done. And I also know of packets of biscuits which are available in the rural markets, which you will just not get in the urban markets. I have picked up biscuits from rural uh, shops, which I don't get in urban. Similarly, there are- Are they good or they're worse? Both ways. Both ways, both ways. right. Okay. Yeah. So that is, a, that is a captive market, I think. The rural market is a captive market where people do push in products which are probably of, there, I have also seen products which are fortified, but I have also seen products which are low in quality and therefore cheaper. So therefore the question that I have for the audience is this. You've heard a bunch of um, both problem statements and aspirational solutions. I mean, we should do better kind of a thing. Are there any concrete suggestions that you have that might actually be tested out at scale or do you have an experience that we can actually say this works or this has worked or this is worth trying? Any show of hands here on the food side? Yes, ma'am. 
Could you get a mic there, please, to the first table? Yeah, uh, so hello. Uh, my name is Rahil Siddiqui, and uh, I'm also a mother and a person who goes and does my household shopping. Um, I think, uh, yes, consciously, I do try to pick up healthy items from the food shelf. Although I always think it's a bit of a dichotomy that we are talking about healthy products, uh, more unrefined stuff, we land up paying a lot more for them. You know, shouldn't refined stuff be more, expen more expensive than unrefined stuff? So I do pick up the organic range as often as I can. Uh, but sometimes I, I look at the pricing and I think, oh my God, this is so expensive. I can buy, you know, just a normal branded stuff for half the price. And uh, sometimes it puts me off. Sometimes it depends on my mood and I might go for it. Um, the other thing uh, which supermarkets kind of tend to do, which is in a way good, um, is they try and promote a lot of these small scale industries into their, uh, like, you know, hyper city and things like this. They'll come and they'll say that we've come from Rajasthan. And I had this uh, where they came and they said, I've come from Rajasthan and I've got this absolutely pure paneer, but it's more expensive than the market rate, but it's pure. And I look at it and I think, you know what? I would have spent another 100, 200 on a silly McDonald's. Um, let me try and foot the bill for these small scale industries because they work so hard in trying to reach the you know, urban sector. So sometimes you do it out of just pure social cause and you think you'll benefit by eating something more pure. There are multiple causes, you know, I don't think a consumer has a set mind frame um, and they only go with it. It depends vastly on uh, the situation you are in at the moment and what product you see you know, on the shelf. Thanks. So Thank very quickly back, um, very valid and you kind of point, put your finger point to something that, um, that I want to kind of um, test it out with you folks. We know that pricing is an issue. We also know that sometimes um, taxation can actually lead to changes in behavior. As in, when we taxed tobacco, we had a consumption change, a pattern change. Is it about time that India became serious about um, negatively pricing certain kinds of food and encouraging other kinds? Because if if something that was bad for you was more expensive, as if as opposed to right now the other way around, the cheaper stuff usually is the more harmful bit. Would we change our consumption patterns? So maybe I can have yes. a go at that. So there are two ways of looking at it, right? One way is you have a sin tax, Correct. sugar tax, or whatever tax you call it. The other way is instead of going on the negative, you focus on the positive. Sure. So there are many markets overseas in the UK and Australia where they have, uh, you know, uh, health star ratings. So in Australia, for instance, if you pick up any product, right, you have stars on that on that product. Which like the BEE ratings for energy efficiency in this country. Something like that. So right. the health rating for that product. Okay. Uh, you know, proteins, carbs, fats, etc. I th I thought I personally think that's a much much positive way of looking at something. So for instance, if there is a product which has a one star rating, it's a consumer's pr choice to take that product or not. Right? Like what ma'am ma said. How many of us actually read the ingredients at the back of a label? Probably none. I do because I'm in this industry, but probably none. But if a consumer has a very easy pictorial way of looking at a product and saying, oh, you know what, four out of five stars, maybe this is good. That could be one way of uh, solving that problem. John, we are only talking about the packaged food, you know, as of now. Yep. But then there are a lot of food which is otherwise there open in the market, which are fast foods. Yep. Right? And uh, I think it is very important to ensure that the registration of those people who are selling the fast food uh, happens, probably some kind of regulation in what is it that they are selling. Because uh, we do see in the um, I mean news that uh, the Gulgappa fellow had something in the water and it was like, I, I don't know how true or false there, it there's is. There's an organized quick serve restaurant and food um, industry which is regulated. You're talking beyond, beyond that. Beyond that. Beyond, beyond that quick, quick serve which is variable quality and uh, availability also. Yeah, and, and, and I think it is rampant in India. How, how do you control? How do you regularize that? How do you, even the FSOs who picks up, 
I know since I, we are working with the salt industry for almost a decade now and uh, despite all our efforts, salt is the least priority for them because it is not lethal. However, whenever they pick up a packet because for them it is also to test and then get into the statutory uh, thing. So they will pick up a Tata salt, they will pick up a Ankur salt, they will pick up something which they know for sure that this is a quality product so that they don't have to go through that entire process of prosecution if at all required or penalizing a processor. You know, so overall I feel there is a need to bring in some kind of enforcement, some kind of regulation and strengthen it uh, to a great extent rather than leave it all loose. I like the idea that Parth is um, suggesting and I'm not sure whether you have found resonance with the food safety uh, FSSAI um, yeah. and, and, and the uh, minister and the relevant department in the Ministry of uh, uh, Food Production, uh, food, Ministry of Food Processing and uh, MOFPI, 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 yeah. MOFPI. I, I forget about the last bit is, um, welcome idea. But I would also want to push back and say that there needs to be a, a, a sin um, pricing on top. Yes, it will take a time for people to kind of look at the stars and be <coughs> cognizant of it. It took a long while for the ISI mark to signify something for products. In the same way, the BE rankings have only now begun to be, have some kind of attraction in the um, community. St star labeling food is a good idea and I suspect that it should be something that we should talk a lot more about. Combined in the short term with also negative pricing might actually push people to choose the higher stars rather than the lower ones, especially if it's going to be more expensive and delivers less value. Yeah. So actually here I would like to appreciate the work done by FSSAI in India. Yeah. They've actually done a fantastic job and like ma'am what you were saying about the street food or the hawker food, right? If you look at one of the 10 initiatives of FSSAI, uh, you know, uh, providing cleaner food through the hawkers is one of one the of them, one of yeah. the action points. Yeah. Right. And now they're looking at it very seriously. So organizations like ours and many others are actually teaming up and helping uh, hawkers and street food providers to actually provide cleaner and hygienic food. But again, it's a huge, huge. task, right? Yeah, yeah. But we but th but that has begun. So that's I think one step which is very positive. And on the other part about you know having a pictorial representation of food, uh, we know that. There are thoughts about it. There are companies which are discussing it. It'll take some time. We are a huge country, a lot of diverse opinions. Things move slowly here, but they do. And I think I'm very positive that we will see some movement towards that kind of uh, uh, system very soon. Yeah, I think just to add to what you said, FSSCI also has done a great job of having the fortification logo out there. So any food which is fortified has to have that logo to identify that it's fortified. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the one thing uh, this whole um, thing has taken us back is to also the uh, huge amount of uh, fresh food and what actually comes out of our soil. So two things, if, if I take a broccoli today, if you, I mean, because we do farming ourselves, so it becomes, so you don't know, it, it becomes like a medical industry, the risk overweighs the benefit. So I take cauliflower, I don't know if my children eat cauliflower, is it going to be good or the pesticide is going to kill them. So this is a very bad dilemma to have. So what is happening is that there is need to uh, also go to the grassroots level and do a lot of change because see thanks to the green revolution there's a lot of space places where the entire soil has got uh, decayed. So there is arsenic in the soil that's coming back in the produce. So at a policy level we need to correct all this. And most importantly, just because we have we have done the global gap, which is global good agriculture practices, you actually, if you do it properly, you build in efficiencies. And that efficiency has to pass back to the consumer. Well, so you will have zero pesticide residue, but you should pass it back to the consumer. Usually what happens, you build efficiencies. Even you can build the same efficiencies in organic. Organic need not be at that exorbitant rate. But the world today, the market is looking only on this premium because you have a huge, just given that we are becoming richer, everybody wants the cream de la cream and just wants to take that pocket. Nobody wants to concentrate on that thing from an industry perspective. So generally, we are looking to a, a, a trajectory in India where people's body mass indices are on the rise, albeit with a qualification that women 
particularly girls, adolescent girls, their anemia levels are still abysmal and needs to change. And that will not happen just with uh, food fortification. It needs to have a far greater impetus on the kinds of food that women and girls are particularly uh, being served and then shared with in a, at a household level. B, we need to be looking at ways in which we are um, encouraging a better quality of product out there, whether it be fresh or packaged and process, processed and packaged, so that the consumer on the other side knows clearly what they are paying for and what they are in for if they make the wrong choices. And that's something that needs to happen both from a demand side and also from a uh, producer side to be complying with the policy which needs to be formulated, which Absolutely. is a function of the demand uh, from the community side. The last bit is that we need to track this much more carefully. I've been asking repeatedly whether somebody could tell me what the birth weight of a baby is at an average by district. Nobody seems to be able to tell me that. Why do I want to know that number? Because that tells me whether the mother has been eating well, because a baby cannot be less than something or more than something if the mother has been undernourished or overnourished. It's, it's a very small band. It tells me exactly what's happening by district at a food intake level. If we don't track certain nutrition outcomes very, very carefully, we end up tracking stars, we end up tracking food safety labels, we end up tracking consumption patterns and not really the outcomes. And the outcomes matter. In this case, if you slide over a certain BMI, you are definitely predisposing yourself to metabolic disorders, to a shortened life, and to much more of an expensive stay in the hospital. Nutrition matters, and it matters in more ways than just satiating your hunger. It actually determines the trajectory of the quality of your life. With that, I want to thank the three of you for being part of this panel thank for this conversation, much. and thank you to the audience for listening to us. Hopefully, if there are more questions, you'll have a conversation with them. Later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. May I ask the so I think uh, I'm just going to end with an ask from the organizers. Let's not have toffees. Let's have nutritious food. Let the change start from here if it has to change. Because let's learn to eat good food. That's a message to you, Kamal. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. And can I ask... Can I ask Mr. Kamal Narayan and Mr. Amitabh Sharma to do the honors? Is Mr. Sharma here? Okay, there he is. Thank you so much.